Now that we're finally done working on the brakes of the car, for the time being, we can finally take a look at some of the other issues. Back in episode 6 of the series, when we were exercising the engine, the coolant temperature gauge on the dash started reading very hot. If you're revving the engine pretty high and not going anywhere, you can certainly heat things up, but I was pretty confident that was not the case here. Beyond that initial high reading, the gauge was also just being kinda screwy. It's possible there's a problem with the engine itself, but much more likely there's an issue with the temperature sender in the cylinder head. This particular car actually has three different kinds of temperature switches on the engine. First, there's a thermostatic switch on the passenger side cylinder head that automatically turns on and off the electric cooling fan. Secondly, there's a coolant temperature sensor in the intake manifold that's used by the engine's computer. And thirdly, there's the temperature sender that we're interested in right now that's the one in the driver's side cylinder head. This coolant temperature sender is the one used by the gauge in the dashboard. Unfortunately, due to its position under the exhaust manifold, it's not easy to get to and even harder to see. Like some of the spark plugs on this car, it might be easier to get to from underneath. But even then, of course, they put a cross member in the way, so when we're working with this sender, I'll just kind of have to paint you a word picture. Before we go into this any farther, what we should do is test the temperature sender. This is a very easy component to test, even if it's difficult to show because of the location of the sender. All we're going to do is use a multimeter to test the resistance between the terminal of the sender and the body of it. Of course, in this case, the body of the sender is directly connected to the engine ground, so to test it, we'll unplug the wire going to the gauge and clip the multimeter lead onto the terminal. Currently, the engine is cold, so we should be able to see a resistance reading that is approximately room temperature. But, not too surprisingly, there is no resistance reading at all, indicating an open circuit, which indicates that this temperature sender is broken. We'll move the wire leads around and make sure we're getting the real reading, but in this case we were. The resistance reading we would expect to see would vary depending on the model the sender is, but at any temperature there should be some kind of connection. In a previous video on this channel, on our 1978 Firebird, we talked about temperature sender resistance readings pretty in depth. And since that car has headers on it, here's a good view of the installed coolant temperature sender. That video gets pretty in depth about sender resistances since we were trying to correct the reading on the dashboard gauge. But luckily, thanks to the forward march of progress, we can much more easily find the correct sender for our 1991 Firebird. By that time, they had standardized the gauges, so there was only one part number and we knew which one to order. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. The most solid information I could get came from a viewer who had the factory service manual for the 1991 Firebird. If anything should have the right resistance range, it should be the factory service manual, but I'm not so sure about these numbers either, especially since it's been a couple years since the car rolled off the assembly line. So what do we do about this? Well, the easiest way to know what our gauge is looking for is to test it for ourselves. And the easiest way to test our gauge without removing anything from the car is to make ourselves a little circuit. And at the heart of our circuit is this potentiometer. By turning this knob, we are increasing or decreasing the amount of resistance between these two wires. This particular one is a 5000 ohm potentiometer, which means it can vary between 0 and 5000 ohms of resistance. That range is probably a bit wide for what we're doing here, so when we're adjusting it, we'll be turning the knob very, very small amounts. And to create our circuit, we soldered two wires to these two legs of the potentiometer. For an initial test, just to make sure everything is working correctly, we have the brown wire connected to the negative lead on the multimeter, and the black wire connected to the positive lead. For the moment, the polarity doesn't really matter. And with the multimeter set to read resistance in the 2000 ohm range, we can turn the knob and verify that everything is changing as it should. Turning the knob clockwise decreases the resistance, and turning it counterclockwise increases it. And again, since this is a 5000 ohm potentiometer, a very small movement creates what for us is a significant change in resistance. There is a lot to say about this particular interaction and electrical resistance, but we won't be getting into that in this video. So we've proven that our potentiometer works, so now we want to introduce it into the gauge cluster circuit. And all this circuit will be doing is replacing the temperature sender with our little device. A temperature sender works very much like this potentiometer in that it outputs a varying resistance. 
Inside that sealed brass housing is a thermistor, which is a component that's resistance varies based on its temperature. So in this case, what should be happening is as the temperature of the switch increases, the resistance between its body and the terminal decreases. So in order to test out the gauge, all we're going to do is replace that sender with our potentiometer. So, for our version of the circuit, we'll hook the black wire to engine ground and the brown wire to the connector for the temperature sender. Then we can turn on the ignition and manually adjust the reading of the gauge. As we turn the knob on the potentiometer clockwise, the resistance decreases and the gauge reading increases. And as we turn the knob counterclockwise, the reading on the gauge, of course, decreases. So this proves that the gauge is moving, but what does that tell us? Well, it appears that the wiring is working, but there's more we need to do in order to get actual data out of this. What we'll do is fine tune the potentiometer until we get the reading on the gauge that we're looking for. In this case, arguably the most important temperature to read is operating temperature. This car uses a standard 195 degree Fahrenheit thermostat. In the same 1978 Firebird episode where we talked about temperature senders, we also talked a fair bit about thermostat temperature ratings. But generally speaking, that rating is around the temperature that the thermostat should start to open. As the temperature increases, the thermostat will open more and allow the flow of more coolant, and as the temperature decreases, it will close a bit more to help regulate the engine's operating temperature. Generally speaking, on a well-functioning car with this thermostat, the engine should be running at a solid 195 degrees on the highway. So that's arguably the most important temperature, and the one we will test for first on our gauge. We'll carefully turn the dial until it reads as close as we can get to 195 on this gauge. Then, being very careful not to bump the dial on the potentiometer, we'll disconnect the wires and reconnect them to the multimeter. And the number of ohms showing on the meter is our 195 temperature gauge reading. We'll repeat this two or three times just to make sure, but 110 ohms seems to be exactly 195 degrees on the gauge. And we'll repeat this same process to take a few more readings so that we have more data to work with. So there you go, now we have enough data that we have a pretty decent profile of what this gauge is looking for in a temperature sender. What's interesting is that this reading is different both from what I had seen online and is extremely different from what the service manual is reporting as normal. Over time, it wouldn't be unusual for a gauge reading to be a little bit off, but that's pretty significant. And the readings of this gauge are consistent across the range, it moves smoothly, and everything is repeatable, so I'm not too sure where the difference lies. But anyway, we finally know the resistance range our gauge is looking for, so we just have to match it up with a temperature sender that has a similar or identical range. And funnily enough, of all the options, that sender we removed from the 78 Firebird just happens to have that exact range. And it would be the perfect replacement, except that the later cylinder heads on the 91 Firebird have a 3 8 inch NPT size instead of half inch. So while it would be possible to adapt this sender, it's not an ideal solution. So after comparing some of the different 3 8 inch NPT senders online, we ordered a standard products TS76. But before we get to that and see how well it works, let's actually do some work on the car. And since we'll be removing the temperature sender, which sits in a water jacket, we can either try to remove the old one and install the new one before all the coolant drains like Indiana Jones swapping out artifacts, or we can just drain the coolant out of the engine. I'm not gonna lie, usually I just go for the Indiana Jones approach and make a mess, but in this case, we wanted to flush the coolant out of this engine anyway, so we'll go ahead and take the boring route. If you remember a few episodes back when we were talking about new parts, we also have new upper and lower radiator hoses. If I had to guess, I'd say the lower radiator hose is fairly old, but the upper was replaced relatively recently, probably when the heads were rebuilt from the engine overheating. Since the water pump was also replaced, there's at least a decent chance that the lower one wasn't reused, but we'll go ahead and replace it anyway. To remove the old hose, we'll loosen the worm gear clamp, and once it's loose enough, we'll let it slide down the hose. But as is often the case with these radiator hoses, it's held on by more than just the clamp. We'll use an angled pick to pry a little bit and start the process of loosening the hose. The car is still sitting on jack stands from the brake work, so it's easy enough to roll underneath and start removing the hose from below. 
And of course, you'll want as big a drain pan as possible underneath, preferably one twice the size of the car, because this coolant is going to go everywhere. The radiator in this car does have one of those handy dandy drain plugs, but for whatever reason, GM decided it didn't need an outlet pipe. This is what the radiator looks like in our 1988 S10 Blazer. It's got the same drain, only it's got a little pipe that you can connect a hose to so you don't have to make a huge mess draining the radiator. But I guess they decided that the Firebird didn't need that, and not only did it not need that, but it doesn't even need to have space below it so it can drain to the ground, so it kind of just fills up the bottom of the core support and spills out all over the place. So if we're going to spill coolant all over the floor anyway, we might as well just pull off the lower radiator hose and do it quickly. Well, it's easier said than done because it's hard enough to find a place to hold onto the hose under the car, but it's, uh, it's on there pretty good. Usually the twist and wiggle and pull method works pretty well. Oh, I, I cannot believe I just said that on YouTube. But what helped out here was to just go ahead and stick a screwdriver in there. Ugh, oh, that's so much worse. But after a bit of effort, the hose had been freed and we could let the coolant drain out of the system. And with the system empty, we'll remove the clamp from the other end of the radiator hose and repeat that same process to completely remove it from the car. So here we have the old hose next to our replacement. There isn't any visible cracking or deterioration of the old hose, so it probably isn't very old at all. But we're already here, and we have a new one that matches up, so we'll go ahead and use that. I generally prefer to have springs in the lower radiator hose to help keep them from collapsing, but this old one didn't have any and I don't have any on hand, so we'll just go without. With the radiator fitting as well as the water pump fitting cleaned up, we'll get the new hose into place on the car and reuse the old clamps to lock it down. After everything has settled, we'll come back and tighten the clamp a bit more. And again, we repeated that same process with the hard to film radiator side of the lower hose. And since most of the coolant is already out of the system, we can remove the upper radiator hose without making a huge mess. First, we'll loosen and remove the two worm gear hose clamps. Then we'll cut the zip ties I was using to keep the upper radiator hose away from the alternator fan. And we can remove the hose. The side that goes to the plastic radiator fitting came off easily, but the other side, just like on the water pump fitting, was quite stuck. We used a flathead screwdriver to pry against the thermostat housing and help remove the hose. And off it goes. Ooh, that is nasty. You know, the coolant in the radiator didn't look all that bad, but this is why it's always a good idea to flush out the coolant. And because everything is so nasty, and since we're here anyway, we might as well replace the thermostat. We've probably done this at least half a dozen times on this channel, so there's a good chance you've seen this all before. We'll remove the two bolts that hold in the thermostat housing. Oh geez, there is a lot of corrosion on that. And the short bolt on the other side isn't all that much better. With the bolts taken out, we'll just grab the thermostat housing and lift it away from the intake manifold. And there's more of that nasty coolant. We'll put the housing aside and try to clean some of this up so that we can remove the thermostat and the gasket in as few pieces as possible. Funnily enough, the housing wasn't stuck in place. It came off fairly easily, but boy, the thermostat does not want to move. But eventually, with a flick of the wrist, we managed to get it out of there. This, while dirty, doesn't appear old, but we'll replace it since we're here. We'll peel off as much of the gasket as we can, and then carefully scrape off the rest with a razor blade. A flat blade screwdriver can also help clean out that recess where the thermostat sits. Then we'll carefully run a tap through the bolt holes to clean out some of that corrosion. Most of it was probably between the bolt and the thermostat housing itself, but the intake manifold is also aluminum and the threads aren't the cleanest. And I've said it before, I guess I should say it again, you really should not use a tap like this. The tap will keep on removing material and you can end up weakening the threads. But at this time, I still didn't have the right thread chaser for this, so it'll work in a pinch. Then, once again, we'll wipe down the whole surface and make sure everything is clean. Then we can drop in our brand new 195 degree Fahrenheit thermostat. By the way, we did check, and the old one was also a 195. A lot of people like to run slightly cooler ones, and I wouldn't mind putting 180 in there, but the computer probably wouldn't like it and it would end up running rich. This thermostat has what's called a jiggle valve, which will help to bleed out any stuck air. 
In the past, we've also drilled holes in thermostats to accomplish that same feat. But in this case, since it has the little valve already, we don't need to do that. In the past, our go-to method for thermostat gaskets was to cut them ourselves, and then give each side a very light coat of RTV to help everything seal. That can especially help with uneven or pitted surfaces, but in this case they're pretty clean. So I figured we'd try another type of gasket. This one is a cork gasket with an adhesive backing. I'm generally a proponent of cork gaskets, although I don't think I've used a thermostat housing one before, so we'll see how this goes. It is pretty neat that the adhesive will hold it perfectly in place on the thermostat housing while you install everything. And of course, before reinstalling it, we also cleaned up the thermostat housing off-screen. We've applied some anti-seize to each of the bolts to hopefully prevent some of that corrosion from reoccurring. We'll get each bolt threaded in and tighten them down snug. To be clear, the gun isn't impacting here, we're just using it to quickly snug them down. Then we'll grab the torque wrench and torque each of those bolts to 25 foot-pounds. And there you go, we have our new thermostat installed. So it's time to replace the upper radiator hose. Only there's a bit of an issue with the new one. Yeah, it's kinda close, but not the right one at all. Though, because of where it sits in relation to the alternator, I'm not sure the old hose is right either. We test fit it, and sure enough, it lines up with that guard on the alternator, but it doesn't work at all with our thermostat housing. We even popped that thermostat housing back off and tried it with a different small block Chevy one with no more luck. So we just decided to reuse the old hose. It appears to be pretty new and in good shape, and it fits better than the other hose, which I suspect might be one for the TPI model of this engine. So we'll swap it back to the other thermostat housing and reinstall the hose. And we'll tighten down the worm gear hose clamps. Just like the lower hose, we'll tighten them just snug for now, and come back a little later to tighten them down more. We'll also have to redeploy our zip tie attachment method, but we can do that off screen. And now we can finally get back to the thing we started this video talking about, the coolant temperature switch. Since the system is still mostly empty, we should be able to remove the sensor without spilling any coolant. We just have to figure out some way to put a wrench on it first. Between the engine mount and the exhaust manifold and all those air tubes, it's not an easy task. We ended up using this flex head ratchet with two adapters and a crow foot socket on it to get the job done. Well, to eventually get the job done because it was in there very tight and we could only turn it uh, maybe a twelfth of a turn at a time. But eventually, miraculously, it was finally loose enough that we could remove it by hand. And there it is, we can finally see the old coolant temperature sender. And here we have the old sensor next to the new one. They definitely look about the same, and even seem to have the same model number, but what about the resistance values? Well, as we established earlier, there's no reading at all because the old one has failed open. At least we can now demonstrate it for the camera and make sure that reading wasn't a fluke. So what about the new one? Well, at the time this video was recorded, it was around 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the garage, and the reading is... 3,000 ohms? That seems pretty high. It's definitely higher than the sender we pulled out of the 78 Firebird that seemed to match the other values of the gauge. But it is pretty in line with the other TBI senders I have tested. And the reading around this temperature doesn't matter very much, it's more so the reading around the operating temperature range that's important. Of course, if we wanted to really give this a test and go the extra mile, we could put it in boiling water just like we did for the senders in that 78 Firebird episode. But what the heck, it seems to have the same part number, so we'll just go ahead and install it and see what happens. We'll apply a light coat of liquid thread sealer to the new temperature sender and thread it into the cylinder head. Well, we certainly tried to, but of course nothing is ever that easy. The new sender just refused to engage with the threads. We ended up using a 3 8 inch NPT tap by hand to clean up the threads, and eventually we were able to get the new sender in place. And since this one didn't require a ridiculous amount of force to turn, we were able to use a regular socket to mostly easily get it tightened back down. And once it was mostly threaded in, we even managed to get the torque wrench on it and started to torque it to 15 foot-pounds, but I think maybe the brass the replacement sensor is made out of is really soft, and it didn't feel great, so we didn't get it to click and just left it as is. 
It was still plenty snug and it's better to leave it there like that than to try to keep tightening it and almost definitely break something. Sometimes that's just how things go. I really like using torque specs, but you can't always rely on them to be correct and they can't account for all variables. But we did get the sensor installed. And once we hook back up its connector and make sure that it fits snugly, we're ready to refill the system with coolant. Using a funnel, we'll add a 50-50 mixture of coolant and water back into this system. Hopefully it goes without saying, but we're using new coolant because this is what the bottom of the drain pan looked like after we emptied out the old coolant. The pan was perfectly clean and gray when we started. Most of that debris is rust from the inside of the engine. This is a perfect example of why it's always a good idea to change out radiator fluid in a new to you car. The coolant in the radiator didn't look all that bad, but because the car had been sitting for a while, all of that old coolant in the system had just been stuck in the engine and was starting to eat away at it. But at least we got most of that out of there and we're refilling it with new coolant now. After running the car a few times, we will change the coolant again to try to flush out more of the system. So let's go ahead and start the car. Everything was running normally, and the system was bleeding itself, as you can see by these bubbles in the radiator overflow. Everything seemed to be going well, although after a few minutes of running it did spring a small leak. But this was just the upper radiator hose needing a little bit more tightening. And once we took care of that, all seemed well with the car. But when putting things back together, we found that the coolant overflow tank cap was still a loose fit and it didn't really want to get tight anymore. What we'll do is use a tip that multiple viewers actually gave me, which is to simply wrap the threads on the coolant reservoir with some Teflon tape to make it a tighter fit. And after six wraps of Teflon tape, the cap goes on really nicely. It's a good enough fit that you can actually get the cap reasonably tight and it doesn't feel like it'll rattle loose. So thank you to everyone who suggested that. And while we're on that topic, here's another thing that was pointed out by a viewer. This serpentine belt is routed wrong. Well, it's not entirely wrong because it does still work, but it results in the tensioner being in a non-ideal position. Since it seemed like all of the labels in the engine bay were removed when it was painted, I didn't have anything to reference, so thank you very much to the viewer who pointed that out, and I got everything sorted out with the tensioner in the right position and the belt routed correctly. And I think that'll about do it for this video, so I'll see you next- What? We didn't talk about the coolant temperature sender. Oh, well, okay, if you insist. Later on, when we were able to run the car more and drive it around a bit, we realized that the coolant temperature sender still wasn't quite right. The cooling system and thermostat appears to be regulating the temperature correctly, and we verified engine temperature by using an infrared gun as well as an ALDL scanner to tell us what the coolant temperature sensor on the intake manifold is reading. We'll talk much more about this scanner in a future episode. But for now, we'll just say that we can confirm that the gauge reads around 15 degrees high. So when idling and driving around town where the engine is around 210 degrees, this is the normal reading. It's certainly not perfect, and we will have to try again to find the right sender for this thing, but it's good enough for now, and at least we'll be able to see if the engine is in the normal range or overheating. Which is good, because the radiator fan is not coming on on its own. The only way to get it to turn on is by using the air conditioner controls in the car. So again, not ideal, but at least I can keep an eye on it and make sure the car stays cool. And for real this time, I think that'll about do it for this long-winded episode. I would give you a sneak peek of what's coming up in the next episode in this series, but I actually don't know. The thing is, we've done so much work on this car, I'm not quite sure where to go from here, so we'll just wing it and we'll see where this goes together.